Good evening from Canada and from little Prince Edward Island on the east coast of Canada. And uh, for all of you in the States, we just want you to know that we're praying for you at this time and praying for all those afflicted with COVID-19 and all the families who've lost loved ones um, over the last number of months. And we're also praying for your president and all those who have been recently stricken with COVID-19. I'm so thankful at a time like this, we can turn to the word of God. And my future is bright. I can't speak about yours. I don't know what awaits me tomorrow. We have had a few new cases, a couple of cases uh, of COVID in our small province today, but we've been relatively safe. But anything could happen tomorrow. And I just want you to know that you're looking at someone who is safe in Christ. I'm happy in this life. My future is secure. My anchor is not a church. My anchor is not my baptism. My anchor isn't my spiritual routines. My anchor is in a person, and his name is Jesus Christ. And so this little session this evening is about you and whether or not you have the same confidence and whether you have the same anchor in life. So not only is my life bright now, but as far as I peer off into the future, beyond death, I am secure in Christ. Wonderful. So it is a message of hope, but I have something rather serious to discuss with you tonight. On Wednesday of this past week, I stood at a little podium in a funeral home with a coffin in front of me. A World War II veteran had died, and I was asked to speak at his funeral. Mr. Taylor was 94. 25 family members were present, all taking the necessary, the responsible, the sensible precautions of wearing masks and social distancing. It was a private funeral due to COVID-19. Mr. Taylor had reached the end of the journey of life. He started the journey on January the 12th, 1926. Perhaps that's the reason why the words the end are on my mind right now. In many ways, it, it was an easy funeral to speak at. The family members were sad, but they weren't sad about where they knew Grandpa Eric had gone. Way back in 1952, before I was born, certainly, at the age of 26, Eric personally entered into a relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ. At age 26, he became a Christian. At 26, he received the Lord Jesus Christ as a Savior. He obeyed the gospel, and Eric went home. To heaven. Now, you've probably been to a number of funerals. Despite what nice things a pastor or a priest or a rabbi or any religious person might say to comfort the family at a time of grief, the Bible is very clear. Only those who personally obey the gospel of God, respond to the good news of Jesus Christ, only those ones end up in heaven. Not everyone goes there. It might sound like it when you go to funerals because people behind the pulpit are searching for words of comfort. And regardless of how the person lived, somehow when you listen to many funeral sermons, you would think they all ended up in heaven, but not according to the Bible. The only ones who go to heaven are those who have obeyed the gospel of God. So we're going to read tonight in 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. And uh, the apostle Peter is writing to believers, to Christians, those who are already saved. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17. And he says, For the time is come, that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, then he asks this sobering question, 
what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? See what Peter was talking about. Uh, verse 16, he says, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. Because, yes, there is suffering for Christians within the family, within the household of God. But if there's suffering for Christians, whatever will it be like for those who obey not the gospel? So we ask that, that question, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? I want to ask you that question. Have you obeyed the gospel of God? So you can go back through your life and you can probably think of when you graduated from university. You may think of your first date. It could have been a wonderful time or you may have made a lot of mistakes. You may remember getting your driver's license. You may recall the day you were married. Sharp memory when it comes to those specific things. Do you have a good recollection of when you obeyed the gospel? See, unless you're stricken with early dementia or Alzheimer's, as my mother suffered from in later years, a person with their mind clear, they remember when they obeyed the gospel of God. So I'm going to ask you the question before I proceed. Have you obeyed the gospel of God? What is the gospel of God? I just say, I picture the planet Earth in all its suffering and tears and misery and people at their wit's end and so much anxiety, so much fear, violence, so many sad things happening. And the Bible, as you read the New Testament, you understand that God loves the world. In my mind's eye, I can see his loving arms stretched out with a warm embrace of planet Earth. He loves all seven and a half billion people. And he loves you. You're not watching this session this evening out of coincidence. God is trying to get your attention. He loves you. The gospel of God is heaven's tender embrace. First Timothy 2 verse 4 says, God desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Sometimes people think that God is some um, mean, desperate, despot, ruling in the sky unpredictable, vindictive, malicious. Friend, that is not the God of the Bible. That is not the Christian God. The Christian God, and there is only one God, is a God who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. That's what 1 Timothy 2 verse 4 says. The gospel is good news. In this dark world, there is good news, great news. Luke's gospel, chapter 2, verse 10. Maybe you have attended a Christmas ceremony or a, a Christian celebration at Christmas time. And you hear the words of the angels in ch chapter 2 of Luke, verse 10. Fear not, the angel said. Behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people for unto you is born this day in the city of David, what? A savior, which is Christ the Lord. So what did the angels announce? Fear not, I've got good news for you. Where would Peter Ramsey have ever been? What would my future ever be like if no savior had been provided for me, the sinner? Good news. What shall the end be of those who obey not the gospel? You're looking at someone tonight, and I have obeyed the gospel, the good news of God, the unlimited provision. First Timothy chapter two, verse five says, there's one God and there is one mediator between God and man. 
the man Christ Jesus. And then it says who gave himself a ransom for all. All. That's pretty inclusive. The unrestricted availability of the gospel. What makes the gospel message the most exclusive message in the world is that it is the most inclusive message in the world. I've, I think I've said this one other time. It's exclusivity is its inclusivity. John chapter three, verse 16 says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You know what the Lord, you read of the Lord Jesus saying in Luke's gospel, chapter nine, verse 56, he said, I didn't come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. That's why Jesus came. Are you saved? I was speaking with children in Sunday school today and Prince Edward Island online virtual Sunday school. And we were learning that verse Luke 19 verse 10. Jesus said. I came to seek and to save those who are lost. Are you lost tonight? Would you like to be saved? John chapter 10, verse 10, again, good news. Jesus said, the thief comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. But I am come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. John chapter 6, verse 37, the Lord Jesus said, whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. He will in this life reject no one, not even you, who comes to him. That's what he was saying in John chapter 6, verse 37. But the question is, have you ever come to him? Sometimes we're afraid to approach a person because we're not sure. They may say, eh, not you. I don't want to be friends with you. I won't accept you. But the Lord Jesus said, whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. What a the good news, the gospel is a great message. Romans 5, verse 1 says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you have peace? I have peace. Not because of the church I attend, not because of my spiritual or religious rituals. I have peace with God. Because I have a personal, precious, precise moment in my life when, as a sinner, kneeling beside my bed with no one coaching me to say certain words or quote a certain prayer, just a sinner all alone with God, by faith, I accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior. The good news of the gospel, the uniqueness of the Christian message. The message of the gospel. Have you ever obeyed it? I'm going to ask you the question again. Have you obeyed the gospel? How unique the gospel message is. The uniqueness of Christianity. I'll give you a few reasons why the Christianity message is absolutely unique. It acknowledges the real you. The real you. See, other religions, you have to try to improve yourself. Present yourself in a more positive light. God will accept you just the way you are, the real you tonight, and he'll work in your life and he'll save you now. So it acknowledges the real you. I am just a sinner. No matter how beautiful I try to make the facade on the outside, how respectable, how admirable the outside may look, how I may restrain and restrict myself from outbursts. That's all within. The uniqueness of Christianity acknowledges what is within and still doesn't shun you. It says, come to me, Jesus says, I will give you rest. The uniqueness of Christianity, reason number two why it's unique, it offers you salvation completely outside yourself. 
Others, other religions say, oh, you have to do your little part. You have to work at it. You have to work. No, the good news of Jesus Christ, the gospel, is that it's salvation from completely outside yourself, and the Savior. And number three, it is a re it's a, the remedy is a totally free gift, independent of your works or effort. Someone visited my website this morning and uh, left me a lengthy email. I said, yes, we believe that Jesus died, but, but you haven't mentioned baptism. No one can be saved without being baptized. And that's not in the Bible. When Jesus was on the cross, he didn't say, it is finished. Now, all you need to do is be baptized. I paid partly for your sins, but now you must be baptized. It's my death plus baptism equals your salvation. No, the remedy is a completely free gift, independent of your works or your efforts. And the fourth reason why Christianity is absolutely unique is our founder is alive. My wife and I were over to Jerusalem a few years ago. We went on a pilgrimage, so to speak, but I wasn't expecting to find the bones or the dust of the Lord Jesus. But I did visit the empty tomb. Our founder is alive. He arose victorious. He did not go down to defeat. Oh, the, there's no message like the gospel. Now, have you ever responded to the gospel message? God is waiting for your response. He is actually listening to the deliberations of your heart right now. Whether you're turning, tuning me out, turning off, about to click off, leave this session. He knows what's going on in your heart. What arguments are going on in your mind? And the question in this verse is, have you obeyed the gospel of God? The word obey is unique. What shall the envy of those who obey not the gospel? Now, I know most of you have heard the gospel and you're hearing it again right now. But that's not the question. What shall the envy of those who hear not the gospel? The question is, what shall the envy of those who obey not? So have you heard? Yes, you've heard. Have you thought about it? Maybe you have. Maybe you're thinking about it tonight. Have you considered the gospel? Yes. Have you ever procrastinated about the gospel message? Maybe yes. But the real question I want to leave with you this evening is, have you obeyed the gospel? And maybe your answer is no. So that makes you someone who has disobeyed the gospel. You know, God takes disobedience very seriously, friend. The first sin in the human family was disobedience. Romans 5 verse 19 says, as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. That's why I am the way I am, because the first man disobeyed God and plunged the human race, all his progeny into darkness. We're all sinners. Disobedience has dire consequences. And so when Peter wrote that question, what shall the end be? Them that obey not the gospel. Obedience is very important to God. Why is it humans struggle with obeying God? You know, just to clarify, obedience is not always white, bare-knuckled rebellion. Oh, disobedience is not always defiance. Gritting of teeth. Disobedience could be could be that stomping out of a room, eyes glaring, fist clenched. Could be deliberate defiance, but disobedience can also be passive resistance. Okay, I'll listen tonight. Thank God you're listening. But you're disobeying if you're not obeying tonight. What shall the end be of those who obey not the gospel? When a child just sort of ignores his parents, 
in their bedroom. Bill, it's your turn to take out the garbage to the roadside. You've heard, haven't you, Bill? Well, maybe your name is Scott. Or maybe it's maybe it's Jessica's turn to do that chore. You've heard it. And you're just up there sort of ignoring it. Did you know that that was not just ignoring? That is nothing less than disobedience. You know, when the Lord Jesus was here, Matthew chapter 8, verse 27, the winds and the sea obeyed Jesus. That's what the Bible says. When he told them, peace be still, creation responded. They obeyed. Even demons obeyed. Mark chapter 1, verse 27 says, demons obeyed him when, he, when Jesus ordered them out. They obeyed. God takes disobedience very seriously. The worst of all sins is to reject the gospel. Here's what John chapter 3 verse 36 says. He that believes on the Son has everlasting life. That word believe there is found 87 times in John. Then it says he that does not. Now, if you're reading King James version it probably says he that does not believe but if you look up the greek word for that second use of believe it's actually he that does not obey the son and that's only found once in the gospel of john shall not see life but the wrath of god abides on him that's john 3 verse 36 acts chapter 17 verse 30 says god now commands all people everywhere to repent without exception it doesn't get more comprehensive than that and it is a command people say i don't know whether you for tell the ten commandments but people say well i try to obey the ten commandments what about this commandment god now commands all people everywhere to repent Acts 17 verse 30 have you obeyed have you repented? Have you acknowledged, oh God, I am a sinner? Have you agreed with God about that? He commands people to repent. Have you obeyed? The Bible says about a future day, 2 Thessalonians verse, chapter 1, verse 8, he says that the Lord will come in a future day in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and Obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So it's really serious. Serious. The failure to obey parents ends in discipline. You're sent to your room. Failure to obey the doctor's orders may result, result in poor health. Failure to obey the speed limits. Tap on your window. Lights flashing. A $200 fine. Failure to obey the tax laws. Prison. But failure to obey the gospel. Is a dark, dark eternity. Why is cancer dreaded so much? People say, well, it's often the beginning of the end. Why is contracting COVID-19 feared by most? Because it could be. The beginning of the end. I know some feel miserable for a few days and then they improve. But by midnight tonight in your country, 210,000 people will have died from COVID-19. That's a lot of homes affected across America. My grandmother, Minerva, was only 28 when she died in the pandemic of 1918. She left behind seven-year-old Jane, five-year-old Albert, my father, three-year-old Eva, 17-month-old Kier. The end came very quickly. She was 28. The end comes later for some, but sooner for most. Most feel that they should have more years ahead of them. But the end arrives prematurely and unexpectedly. So as you start your new week, what of the end was this week? 
for you. Oh, you say, you're desperately morbid. I'm trying to be faithful. You know that this is not just preacher talk or, or pulpit hyperbole. You know that thousands will die this coming week. They thought they would live. Car accidents, other diseases, gunshots, many ways. What of your life? What shall the end be? End, end. It doesn't say what shall the life be. And you could ignore the gospel message from now until you die. It doesn't say what shall the life be of those who obey not the gospel. It says what shall the end be? The end, inevitable, sooner rather than later. It's uncontrollable. You can't avoid the end. It's irreversible. You can't. It, things can't be changed after you die. Often I've heard stories of Niagara Falls and in the olden days when people would get on a raft. You don't read about it so much now and, they are, and, and they're drifting towards the precipice. They've fallen asleep in a little dory, little boat, and then they wake up just as they're going over the brink. What a rude awakening. Let me ask you, are you prepared for the end? The end. You might have a great life. You can ignore this message and you may get a, a yacht. You may have your own private jet. I don't know. You may have a great life, but this verse is not about your life. It's what shall the end be of those who obey not the gospel. Uh, perhaps you've heard tell of Woody Allen. I mean, he's lived a very successful life. He's got all kinds of awards. I just printed out a little thing here, two Golden Globe Awards, Grammy Awards, Academy, Award, uh, Academy Awards, 24 nominations, host of other awards. He's getting older now. He spent most of his life mocking God or denying the existence of God. You can watch him. Perhaps you've seen him mock God. But I've been following him a little bit. You know, at, when he was aged 72, he said, while others laugh over my jokes, I go to sleep at night. I lie awake at night. This is a quote. I lie awake at night, terrified of the void. 72. Oh, when you're 20 and you're 30 and you're 40, you can mock. You can make light of things. But he's 72 and he's saying, while others sleep, I lie awake at night, terrified of the void. And then a few years later, he's going on. He said, I'm, I'm afraid. He said, life is at 78. He says, life is tough, brutal, grim, meaningless grind, full of heartache and tragedy, accruing to nothing. In the end, that you, you realize that you're just a human being on the face of the earth, an insignificant agglomeration of cells and neurons. Then he says, and eventually that expires. And eventually everything expires. And then he adds, it's terrifying. What's Woody Allen thinking about at 78? The end. Another quote. And he was a few years older in his 80s. He said, I try to distract my life, my thinking from the end by looking at baseball games or watching old movies. He said, I, it's a lot of stuff, but I like watching anything that is, here it is, not terrifying. He's thinking about the end, friend. I'm not terrified about the end. I, I don't want to die. I'm enjoying my life. I love my family. I'm not courting death. But I'm not terrified to die. I'm not terrified of the end. I'm in Christ. That's what the gospel message is all about. How you can be saved and absolutely sure that you're going to be with Christ forever. I was telling you about Eric Taylor at 94. Saved. Good friend of ours. Oh, it's a few years ago, Jan Sluter, probably over a decade ago now. She had ALS and then she contracted uh, uh, cancer and uh, she was dying. She was in a hospice unit. And I, I, I saved an email from dear Jan Sluter and she was, she was not afraid to die. 
she was approaching the end, very conscious of the end, and she talks about hour by hour, it's growing sweeter all the time. And she talks about the Lord Jesus and how wonderful it will be to be in the presence of Christ. Do you have that assurance? Can you say, look at Peter, so many years ago or so many months ago or just earlier today, I found out that Christ died for my sins and I received him personally as my savior. I'm going to ask you as I close, will you finally trust Christ now? What good reason do you have for not obeying the gospel as we conclude this session? Any good reason? Would you call it resistance or reluctance? Do you have some personal animosity or hostility towards Jesus Christ? Do you find him untrustworthy? Do you think knowing your sins are forgiven and that Christ is your savior, do you think that won't bring you peace? That it will only bring you on rest and turmoil if you knew that your sins were given and if you were linked eternally with God through the Lord Jesus Christ? You say, Peter, those are rhetorical questions. They are. The answer is obvious. If you would open your Bible this evening and find out that Christ died for ungodly sinners, and if you obeyed the gospel, you could have the same peace that I have. You could have the same Christ that I enjoy. And when someone holds up the question, the next time you're at a session like this, have you obeyed the gospel? You'll be able to put your fist in the air and say, yes, thank God. I have obeyed the gospel. I have Christ as my savior. Heaven is my home. I have peace that I would not exchange for anything else. Friend, I'm going to close in prayer now. I'm going to ask you again, why will you not obey the gospel of God right now? Do you have a good reason? 100 years from now, will that reason be as good? Christ will have you this evening. He'll save you. God will work in your life right now and, and save you, deliver you. Change you from the inside out. It's called being born again. It's called salvation. It's called becoming a Christian. It's called a possessor of eternal life. Our prayer for you, with all everything else that is going on in your life, is that this night, don't procrastinate, this very night, you will trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior and be saved.